We're going to go ahead and kick it off. My name is Jordan Benchia. I'm the executive director of the VIN Foundation, and I'm happy to have you all here with us as we focus on applying smarter to veterinary school. And the focus of this webinar is focusing on the Apply Smarter tool, as well as the Apply Smarter message boards and um, some of our pre-veterinary resources, which are here to help pre-vets. And so a few housekeeping things, you will notice that there is a Q&A window, and we really encourage all of you to put questions in the Q&A window. You are also able to upvote questions. So if you see a question that you like and you think, I really wanna make sure that's answered, go ahead and give that a thumbs up and that'll help bump it up to the top of the list so that we make sure that we cover it. Um, also, we want to keep the chat window just for any technical issues. So please only put the technical issues in the chat window and put all of your questions in the Q&A window. By registering for this webinar, we will be sending out a recording tomorrow, probably tomorrow by the end of the day, within the next couple of days, um, with, with information on the recording as well as additional helpful links. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our VIN Foundation board member and student debt expert, Dr. Tony Bartel. Great. Thank you, Jordan. And thanks, everyone, for joining as we're going to kick off this um, Apply Smarter webinar and uh, talk about some of the tools we have on VIN Foundation and how to make sense of this concept that we call apply smarter. So hopefully you can integrate some of these strategies into your veterinary school application process. So um, over the years, uh, we've amassed a lot of experience, um, help for better or worse, uh, helping our colleagues, veterinarians and veterinary students um, craft strategies for paying back their student debt. And uh, you guys may not know it yet, but student debt is a pretty big issue, uh, particularly for veterinarians, right? And uh, veterinarians often have uh, or can have quite a high student loan balance that they accrue mostly from veterinary school, right? Now, you, you, some of you may already have some student loans that you're using to fund your undergraduate uh, activities um, or satisfying prerequisites for veterinary school. But when you get to veterinary school, most students, most veterinary students finance that or pay for that by using U.S. federal student loans, right? So, um, and that can create a, a rather large balance depending on the school that you choose, which is why how you approach application is so important. So, you know, we've come to realize that we need to keep working our way back further and further into the process until we get to you all where, who are actively applying or considering applying to veterinary school, because a lot of these things are um, outside of your control, except at the point where you're applying. Right. So and that's where we've come up with this uh, concept called applying smarter. Right. And we're going to show you uh, not only what schools are out there. I'll give you kind of a, a tour around, um, you know, what what the available schools are uh, in the U.S. There's 33 currently. And there's some other ones that are coming online and there's there's some additional um, what's called a multi-location or plus programs where you can start at one campus and then you'll finish finish that veterinary education at another. Uh, but all of them have very different cost profiles. Right. And depending on which ones you apply to and then ultimately which ones you're accepted to and choose to attend veterinary school, that will determine how much student debt that you end up with at graduation. And it's always easier to manage less than it is to manage more student debt. So we want to show you how you can apply some of the uh, ideas that we've we've um, uncovered over the years here to not only help you get in sooner or the first time that you apply, uh, but also pay the least possible for that education so you have less student debt to manage. So that's where we're going to kind of start. Um, actually, let me show you where some of the schools are. So um, on the VIN Foundation website, and we'll make sure that we've got some, we'll post some links for you all too. And, and a lot of these things will be included in the Prezi itself. But on the uh, one of the VIN Foundation resources called Vet School Bound, so vetschoolbound.org, we have a cost of education toolkit that comprises the cost of education map. There's a cost of education tool, shows you the schools ranked by cost. Um, and then we'll also talk about what we have uh, called an apply uh, 
smarter tool as well that tries to help you narrow down based on where you live what the um, available school options are for you that fall into this category that we consider to be apply smarter. So if I hit the cost of education map, we've got a geographical map, and th these are not all of the veterinary schools in the world um, or even in North America yet. We're working on that, but they are all of the different programs that are in the U.S. and uh, the ones that are in the uh, Caribbean islands there. So here you'll get an idea of which schools are out there. I, I think I saw that posted in one of the registration submissions was, hey, I, I'm not even really sure how many different vet schools there are out there. Well, there's there's 33 programs currently in the US. And then there's a handful of ones that are in the Caribbean. And then there's also a handful of what we're calling multi-location programs. So an example of that would be uh, a two plus two program with Nebraska, you start your first two years in Nebraska Lincoln, and then you finish your final two years at Iowa State, where the veterinary school is, right? So it's, they're usually kind of in a ge close geographical region, although there's an exception to that. The vet school that I went to, Colorado State, so up here in Fort Collins, has a two plus two program with Alaska Fairbanks. So students who are residents of Alaska can start their first two years in Alaska, and then they come down to Fort Collins in Colorado to finish those two years uh, of remaining two years of vet school, and they graduate from Colorado State's veterinary school. So this will kind of just give you an idea, initial idea of what veterinary schools are out there. Um, you can filter it by state. Um, you'll notice that not every state has a veterinary school program, and some states have more than one veterinary school program. Uh, like California has two veterinary schools, Arizona has two veterinary schools, but those are two good examples of why the supply smarter concept is so important. One is a state school, one is a private school, the cost differences are significant. And so if you're using something like student loans, you want to be aware of those cost differences, particularly if debt is something that stresses you out. Right, so that's what we want to just set the stage for tonight to you know help you understand that not all veterinary school seats are equal right and some are going to cost you much more than others all right so let me come back to my presentation all right i'll tell you uh before we dive into some of the concerns that you all submitted uh leading up to this webinar um i'm going to tell you a little bit about, my, about myself and why i care about this so much so um, I'm a veterinarian. Uh, I'm married to a veterinarian. We both went to Colorado State Veterinary School. My wife finished before I did. She went on to specialize in small animal internal medicine and as an internist here along the front range. Uh, that's what we call kind of the, the towns along the uh, Rocky Mountains here uh, in Colorado where we live in Denver. Um, but together we have more than $400,000 of student debt, right? And it's a lot, right? It's a big number. Um, it's not insurmountable, right? We're able to manage it. We have a family. Um, we do things outside of um, veterinary medicine, and you know we have a lot of other interests and and goals that we have uh, personally, professionally, and financially that we can still accomplish with that amount of student debt. Uh, but it is complicated, right? And it, and, it, and it sometimes it's a little bit more than um, people are uh, willing or able to take on in terms of management. So that's where we provide a lot of help and resources uh, to help our colleagues, our veterinary student and veterinary veterinarian colleagues navigate these challenges of, you know, what's the best repayment strategy? Or if you don't want to be in debt, like, you know, some veterinarians don't want to be, how can you apply smarter to avoid those schools where you might end up with a $400,000 student loan balance, right? And maybe you can attend one that's less expensive um, and has a much more manageable um, uh, price tag. So if you already have student loans, uh, the student aid website, studentaid.gov is a great place to start. You can grab what we call a student aid data file from there and download that. That kind of gives you a, a place to start, or maybe you don't have student loans yet at all. And your first uh, experience with U.S. federal student loans will be when you're borrowing for veterinary school. Either way, we can help you understand what that looks like, right, using what we call the Vin, Found, Vin Foundation Student Debt Center. So you would start on this My Student Loans tool, and Vin Foundation Student Debt Center is a publicly available resource 
um, within the universe of resources that Ben Foundation provides publicly. Uh, and this can help you start to numerically evaluate the impact your student loans, if you already have some, or if you don't have student loans yet, but will when you start veterinary school, what that's going to contribute to your overall price tag for your veterinary school education. And I'll come back to this and I'll show you how uh, we can use these specifically to make sense of the different veterinary school options that you're going to have with some case studies that we'll go through in a little bit. All right, so what you all told me your primary concerns were um, are here, right? So I, I, I pasted some of the ones that I found to be particularly interesting and, and, and overlap nicely with the content that we're going to cover this evening. But there's a, there's a lot of themes, right? So getting in and the cost, right? Getting accepted, tuition and cost. Getting accepted, right? That That's obviously, I mean, I remember that when I decided that I wanted to go to veterinary school, you know, getting in and getting in that first time you applied is, is a real big priority, right? So, um, you know, the, think, thankfully, the apply smarter concept nicely overlaps with getting in and paying the least possible for your veterinary school education. And, that, and we'll connect those dots for you here just a little bit. But we see also some concerns around, you know, paying out-of-state tuition. You don't have to pay out-of-state tuition, right? Even if you don't have a veterinary school in your state, right? I'll, you may have to pay out-of-state tuition one year, right? But you, you want to avoid those places or applying to those places where you would have to pay out-of-state tuition for all four years. Or in the case of uh, University of Arizona is a three-year program, right? But if you're a non-resident of Arizona, that's going to cost you a lot more than if you're a resident of Arizona. Right? Private schools don't have an out-of-state or in-state designation, right? They don't have a cheaper rate in most cases, right? So those private schools, you really got to think twice about whether or not you want to apply to one of those private schools because that's how you can end up with, you know, 300, 400 plus thousand dollars of student debt. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I wanted to just make sure that we're touching on these concepts that, that you guys are uh, indicating are your concerns as you're approaching this application process. So just something to think about, and you're, you're welcome to put um, answers in the, the chat here. I don't have a formal poll for you, but I'll, I'm just going to kind of throw it out there for you to think about, right? How much will it cost you to become a veterinarian and I've already you know given you an idea of what our student debt is that's our my wife and my combined student debt and granted we graduated now you know more than 10 years ago so you know just think about what it will cost you to become a veterinarian right and there's a lot of different choices here right a lot of pre-vets tell us that they're, they don't even care what the number is right that they just whatever the number is they're willing to pay for it and that's where you can you can get into some real trouble. But the answer here is is any or all of the above, right? It really depends on the school that you apply to, and how much of that you have to uh, finance using student loans, right? So some of the least expensive schools you can still finish school borrowing less than a hundred thousand dollars. Um, to finance that. It's difficult, but it, it's still possible. And we see, um, we were just working, I'm just working with a um, a new graduate this week who uh, borrowed $92,000 and finished their education um, and is heading on to an equine internship, right? It, but having $92,000 of student debt and heading into an internship is still going to present a challenge for that particular person financially to make those numbers work. Right, because as an intern, she's going to earn forty thousand dollars a year, right? So even though she did a great job of keeping her educational costs very low, she's still going to have a challenge in terms of navigating that next year, where she's paid a very low salary because she's an intern. So we have to help her get to that next phase of her career, where hopefully she's going to be earning a lot more, right? So that's where being cognizant of how much your veterinary school education will cost and how much you're going to have in student loans really, really, you know, the rubber meets the road, so to speak, right? So that's where it, where it starts to become challenging is when we have to pay this back. All right, so how much on the other side of the 
equation is income, right? We can't really talk about debt without talking about income as well, right? And everybody always says, you know, I don't, I don't go into veterinary school or I didn't choose to become a veterinarian for the money. Well, at some point the money is going to matter, right? Because you have to pay for stuff, right? I mean, you have to pay back your student loans. You have to pay for your housing, food. You know, you're going to have professional expenses just to practice veterinary medicine. And then all of us have other goals beyond that, right? Maybe you want to buy a home or you want to be a practice owner or you want to start a family or you want to travel or whatever the case is, um, you're going to need some funds to do that, right? And just kind of like our last question, the answer here, and I've already given you a little bit of a hit with that internship person, but the answer here is, again, is any or all of the above, right? It really depends upon what you do after you finish veterinary school, right? So if you go on to do an internship, you're probably going to be at the lower end of the scale, but that's probably only going to be for a year, maybe two. And then if you do a residency, maybe a little bit longer, if you're going to plan to specialize. But if you go straight into general practice, it's probably going to be, you know, somewhere between this 90 and 130,000. Or if you end up going into something more like emergency medicine or urgent care, it might be at the higher end of the spectrum. Right, so any or all of the above is the answer. Now, ideally in a perfect world, if you are just looking at this from a financial analysis standpoint, you would want to pay as little as possible for your education and make as much as possible after you graduate, right? But we know that our, you know, veterin most veterinarians aren't generally wired like that, right? So we see a lot of, um, you know, everything along the spectrum, people borrowing a whole bunch and then making not very much all the way to people borrowing very little and making a lot of money, right? So it really just depends on what your interests are and then how your career unfolds as a veterinarian. All right, this is another uh, graph that I like to use that helps to illustrate uh, um, this concept around Apply Smarter where we describe that veterinary medicine doesn't have uh, a quote Harvard effect. Um, and what does that mean, right? When you, if you choose to go to a school like Harvard to be a lawyer or something like that, generally speaking, you can expect to have a higher income because of the school that you chose to go to, right? We don't see that same phenomenon in veterinary medicine. Whether you graduate from Texas A&M or Cornell or Penn, right? You're generally going to earn the same amount as a veterinarian, right? And that amount is going to be determined by the type of practice you pursue and where you practice it, right? So generally speaking, companion animal veterinarians, so those that work with small animals, dogs and cats, and working in practices that are in urban environments, tend to have the highest incomes, right? If, if you uh, graduate and you want to be a mixed animal practitioner in say rural Kentucky, right? You're probably gonna have a lower income than an urban companion animal practitioner, right? Not because of the school you went to, but because of how those prices are structured in that particular geographical region. Right. So by that standpoint, it doesn't make sense financially for you to pay more for your veterinary education than you have to. Right. Because, again, there's not any bonus or there's not any um, penalty for one school over the other. Right. It really is a matter of what you choose to do afterwards. And this graph does a great um, does a great job of illustrating that. Right. So the blue bars are the debt reported by the graduates of these schools. You can see the blue bars are much higher. Midwestern private school, Tuskegee private school, Western University in California private school, Lincoln Memorial private school. When we get to Ohio State, that's finally a state school, but there's a, there are those that pay an in-state rate and those that pay an out-of-state rate, right? So you can see that there's some pretty big differences on how, what they report in terms of their debt, but the incomes in this green line really don't vary much at all. And to the extent that they do, it has more to do with what percentage of that class goes on to do an internship versus not, right? Because all of those people are included in that, in that median income analysis. More data is available. 
on the AAVMC, so the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges, they also have a, a really robust data set that talks about debt income. Uh, there's even some application statistics in there. Uh, but here you can see too, kind of that same illustration. It's just a little bit newer data, right? So mid is Midwestern. Uh, this abbreviation RUSVM is Ross. So that's one of the Caribbean schools. WES is Western. LMU is Lincoln Memorial. SGU is St. George, right? So that's another Caribbean school. So hopefully you're starting to see a theme here, right? The private schools, the Caribbean schools, they tend to graduate veterinarians with some of the highest student debt totals, right? So, you know, if, if student debt is something that stresses you out or you want to minimize your student debt, these are probably schools that, that shouldn't make your cut when you're applying. Right, because those if you get into one of those schools, it, it's quite likely that you're going to graduate with a with a relatively high student loan balance. And again, there's that there isn't that Harvard effect, right? We don't see any. Uh, you don't stand to earn more because you paid a higher price for your veterinary school education, right? And in the AVMA reports that come out, AVMA economic team puts out a report every year on the state of. Um, Economics and Veterinary Medicine, uh, this 2021 report, school choice is the most significant factor for explaining variations in DVM debt, but school choice does not have a significant impact on starting salaries. So that's exactly the same thing that I've been calling uh, this no Harvard effect. You're going to also see if you dive down this rabbit hole at all in terms of debt and income in veterinary medicine, you're going to see them talk about the student debt to income ratio a lot. Right, so we take our student debt, we divide it by our income that we're earning as a veterinarian, we get a debt to income ratio. And that debt to income ratio is kind of used as, as what they call a key performance indicator, measuring your ability to pay back that student debt. Right, the higher your debt to income ratio, the harder it is to pay back that student debt and navigate the rest of your, finan uh, your financial goals. Right, so generally speaking, it's a good idea to stay away from those schools that are going to put you at that higher debt to income ratio spectrum than at the lower debt to income ratio spectrum. How do you do that, right? It first starts with identifying what seats are available, right? So in-state, out-of-state is pretty common knowledge, right? So a school like Ohio State has both in-state and out-of-state seats. UC Davis, in-state and out-of-state seats. Illinois, same way, right? In-state, out-of-state. Virginia, there's a vet school, uh, Virginia, Maryland, and Blacksburg, um, where there's in-state opportunity for both residents of Virginia and Maryland, right? But anybody that's not in one of those two, those two states are going to pay an out-of-state tuition rate for Virginia, Maryland's College of Veterinary Medicine, right? So anybody that's out-of-state, non-resident or even a private school is you know what I call a non-discounted seat right or a full price seat those tend to be the highest prices which command or will result in some of the highest amounts of student debt so what is the apply smarter concept at its core it, it is encouraging you to apply to the schools with the lowest cost to you as possible the lower your student debt uh, the higher your return on your investment which veterinary school is an investment in your career and so you want to pay as little as you have to for that career and then maximize your earnings on the other side of, of, of school. So applying to veterinary school, where does it start? AAVMC, I mentioned that before, the American Association of uh, Veterinary Medical Colleges, that's who runs VIMCAS or the Veterinary Medical College Application Service. And most of the U.S. veterinary schools go through VIMCAS. I think the only two exceptions are the two schools in Texas. So Texas A&M and Texas Tech are the only two schools that don't participate in VIMCAS. So you apply uh, directly to those schools separately. So um, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure why they don't participate in it, but uh, th those are the only two that I'm aware of that don't participate in that particular um, application service. Um, so I want you to, when you're thinking about application, and I saw, I see your question in there, Kira, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. We're going to talk about that in the cost section here. Um, but how do you apply smarter? You know, generally want to get you to think about, think beyond, you know, things like transcripts, 
prereqs, letters of recommendations, whether or not there's an interview, what type of tests you have to take. All of those are kind of like the, you know, basic application requirements, right? Those are things that you could easily look up um, on this a particular school's website. And I'll even show you a resource that has a lot of that uh, laid out for you per school. Um, but when it comes to Apply Smarter, we, we find that most pre-veterinary students don't really consider the cost, particularly the cost of uh, like tuition fees, cost of living um, in that whole equation, right? They're more worried about these things because these are the things that provide, uh, you know, kind of put up that barrier to you actually getting into school, right? But we really want you to not only get into school, right? But we want you to make sure that you're not paying more than you have to. And that's where the odds thing is, is it's really interesting, right? This is probably, I would say, uh, the, the biggest secret in applying to veterinary school. You know, this is not walking around knowledge, right? So good on you for showing up and, and, and learning this because this will really help to increase your odds of getting accepted. So generally speaking, people think it's really hard to get into veterinary school, right? And that, that can be true, right? But it again, it depends on which seats we're talking about. Overall, um, if we look at, I'm going to zoom in on this one a little bit more. If we look at the, this is AABMC data, uh, and 2022 is the most recent data that we have here uh, for applications. There was about 11,000 applicants. And if we take all of the available first year seats, um, 4755 representing the schools that are uh, represented by the AAVMC, that's an applicant to seat ratio of 2.3. Right? So there's 2.3 seats available for each applicant. Right. So that that's overall. Right. But not everybody applies to every school. Right. And but not every seat is the same either. Right. So generally speaking, state the state schools, public schools admit more in-state residents. Right. So they have seats available for residents of that particular state, which makes it a little bit easier from an odd standpoint to get into your state school than it is if you're trying to apply for a non-residency, right? So for, for, for instance, I'll pick on Illinois again. So Andrea, you said you're from Illinois. So it's easier for you, markedly easier for you to get into University of Illinois veterinary school than applying as a non-resident to say, you know, LSU or UC Davis. Right, because you'll see, as I'll illustrate here with these two schools, um, your odds of getting in as an in-state resident to a state school are much higher than applying to a non-resident or private school. Right, so, and thankfully, the um, those are the cheaper seats too. Right, it's going to be much cheaper. Cheaper again, Andrea, I'll pick on you as an example. It's going to be much less expensive for you to go to Illinois as your veterinary school than it will to go to go to say LSU as a non-resident. Right. And it's going to be easier for you to get into Illinois as well. Right. So let's look at the LSU admissions stats because this one is probably one of the more striking ones that that I see. And I use this one on purpose again because it's it it is so uh obvious to illustrate this point. So Louisiana, where LSU is Right, so they get for this class that started the this past fall. So the class of 2027 started veterinary school in the fall of 2023. Right, LSU is a four year program. You start in the fall of 2023. You're going to graduate in 2027. There was 198 resident Louisiana residents who applied. 67 were admitted. Right, that's do some math there. 67 divided by 198. Right, 34% of the applicants from Louisiana were admitted to LSU's vet program. One in three, right? Does that sound hard? Right, I mean, of course it's hard. You still have to, what's hard is meeting all the prereqs, right? Is making sure that you're actually uh, a candidate who can be accepted. That's hard, right? But once you've checked those boxes, right? your odds of getting into LSU 
as a Louisiana resident are actually pretty darn good, right? One in three, that's pretty good. Right now, LSU actually has an arrangement with Arkansas. Arkansas doesn't have a vet school yet, although they're supposed to in the next couple of years. Maybe some of you might be able to apply there, right? But they right now they have an arrangement with residents of Arkansas that can attend LSU and pay an in-state rate. So they can pay in a discounted rate, even though they don't have a vet school in the state of Arkansas. Right. So Arkansas residents, there was 67 Arkansas residents applied to LSU, 16 got in. All right. So let's do our math again. 16 divided by 67. Oops. 16 divided by 67. So 24 percent, right? Roughly one in four Arkansas residents that applied to LSU got in. Not as good as the Louisiana residents, but still pretty darn good. Um, way back in the day, LSU used to have a, a special arrangement with uh, residents of Puerto Rico where they could also pay in-state uh, tuition. I don't believe that still exists, uh, but they still kind of track this separately because it's, you know that still attracts a lot of Puerto Rico residents to apply to LSU. So 12 out of 49, pretty good, right? Pretty good odds there of getting in, right? For that particular group of folks, another 24% there, right? Now, if you look at the non-residents, so other people that didn't fall into one of these other buckets, 37 divided by 1,154, right? 3%. Right. This is what makes it seem like it's really hard to get into veterinary school. If you're throwing your hat in the ring as a other resident for a state school, this typically is what your odds look like. Right. So, yeah, you can still get in. Right. But you've got to be a really, really, really strong candidate. And even if you do get in, you're paying you know, two to three times more, right? Even though you were a really strong applicant, which doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So, you know, I mean, it, it, these are pretty striking. I mean, the you know, it's 10 times easier to get into LSU simply by living in Louisiana than it is if you don't, right? And you'll pay less for that if you're a Louisiana resident. So, you know, use those those application statistics, almost all of the schools will show you those same stats, right? Now, LSU, again, is, is pretty striking. Uh, UC Davis actually has a more recent set of statistics. This is the class that's actually starting next month, right? So this, I need to blow this up, yeah. right? Not as dramatic, right? So we got, you know, 141 California residents were offered admission out of 942 applications. I mean, California is a must bigger state too, right? So there's a lot more, on average, there's a lot more people applying for veterinary school, right? But the odds of a California resident keep receiving an offer of admission are still much higher than, you know, the, uh, the non-residents, right? So out of state, which were in this case, um, 38 were offered admission out of 973 applications, right? So there's a dramatic difference, particularly for the state schools, in terms of those who receive an offer of admission versus those who don't, versus in-state and out-of-state applicants. So you can use that information to your advantage when you're applying. Um, you may even, I mean, if you feel really strongly about a particular state school, you may even want to consider moving to that state establishing residency uh, before you apply. That's what I did for Colorado State, right? When I was a, I knew I was a career changer when I applied to veterinary school. I, I was in corporate finance before this and I really didn't want to uh, see what happens if I didn't get in the first time. And quite frankly, I couldn't afford to not get in the first time. If I didn't get into vet school, I would have had to have moved on because I wouldn't have been able to afford waiting another year to apply again. So when I realized that I had much higher odds of getting in if I was a Colorado resident, I moved to Colorado, established residency, and made sure that I was considered an in-state resident when I applied. Right, And that worked out. That worked out really well for me. So, I mean, that's kind of dramatic. Not everybody can move to a different state 
just to apply to vet school. But if that is something that you can do, it can greatly increase your odds of getting in. And it also aligns with having you pay less. So where do you want to go to vet school and why? Right? Will you need to use student loans? How much will it cost plus interest? We did live through a very unique time frame where we didn't have to pay uh, interest on student loans for, for quite a while, but that's not the world we live in anymore. Right? And his interest is handled much differently for graduate school, veterinary school, than it is for undergraduate school. Right? In undergraduate schooling, you have what are called subsidized loans, which means you don't have to pay interest while you're in school, and you won't have to pay interest on those loans even when you're in vet school. But the loans that you take for veterinary school will accrue interest while you're there, which can add significantly to your cost. Does that stretch? Does it stress you out? Uh, some people it really, you know, drives them a little nuts. Other people don't really care, right? But it is still something that we're going to have to manage. I mean, you know, more than eighty percent of veterinary students graduate with some amount of student debt, right? So knowing how to manage it um, is is really important. And having less is always easier to manage than having more. Is there a discounted tuition rate for you? The answer is always yes. But right? even if you live in a state that doesn't have a vet school, there are options for you to pay less than a full price or less than a non-discounted rate for that uh, entire program. And we'll talk about uh, what those options are. Do you have family assistance? Um, well, you have to borrow your living expenses, right? So this kind of gets to uh, this kind of gets to Kara's question. You know, do most loans help you with housing? Uh, yes, they do. When you get to graduate school, you're able to borrow up to the cost of attendance, which is determined by the school, which also includes an allowance for living expenses like housing. And so you can borrow for the housing costs as well. But that also adds to the amount of student debt that you'll manage. It also adds to the amount of interest that will accrue while you're in school. What scholarship grant options are available, right? There's a lot of, especially at state school, there's a lot of different uh, scholarship and grants that are out there that are available to you. Um, Vin Foundation even offers a scholarship. The first awardees are starting vet school this fall. So a student from Washington who's attending Washington State and a student from Kentucky who's attending Auburn. So Kentucky has an arrangement with Auburn uh, for certain amount of Kentucky residents to pay in-state tuition at Auburn. And those two students are the first recipients of the Mike Dunn Veterinary Student Scholarship created by Becky Gottschow. And we're gonna do that again for the following fall. Uh, so we're taking applications for that particular scholarship now. And that scholarship, the requirements are uh, based around the Apply Smarter concept. Right? So you can receive up to $35,000 per year for a total of $140,000 for the entire veterinary program. Right? But one of the cruxes of the uh, application or one of the requirements of the application is the program cannot cost more than $170,000 total for tuition and fees, right? So that aligns with some of the apply smarter concept we're talking about now, right? So it would be those state schools or some of those schools that you're able to um, obtain in-state tuition after the first year or some of those two plus two programs or one plus three programs where you can still have a lower total tuition and fees than if you were to apply to and gain admission to a non um, an out of state school or a private school. All right, so let's talk a little bit about paying for veterinary school um, and, and the loans themselves. So I already mentioned this, but veterinary school is graduate professional school. Uh, you're eligible to borrow up to the school's cost of attendance. Right? And there are certain limits on some loans, but then we have these direct grad plus loans that are essentially unlimited. They will fulfill whatever the need is as established by the school up to what the school's cost of attendance is, right? And this is this is a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing in that if you don't have any financial resources, you are able to borrow 
whatever the school says you need to attend something like veterinary school, right? The curse part of it is it literally is unlimited, right? So if you choose the most expensive school, you can end up with student loans in excess of a half a million dollars, right? Plus interest, right? So it, 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 it really, it's kind of a, I mean, it, it's a blank check, right? But that's where some of the, you know, having some um, guidance on what that means and how to maybe avoid some of those really upper end limits of the uh, the student debt that we see comes into play, right? And, and that's where the Apply Smarter concept really um, can make a difference. There are limited subsidized loan options available. Health profession student loans, loans for disadvantaged students are available at some, uh, mostly state schools, although there's a couple of private schools that offer these health profession student loans. But these are the only types of loans that are available to veterinary students that are, quote, subsidized, meaning they don't accrue interest while you're in school. They're also offered at much lower amounts than, than these types of loans are. So these are great if you can get them and they help to reduce the amount of loans that you take in this category, but it, you can't really finance an entire veterinary school degree with these types of loans only, where it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, none of this is to scare you away from student loans. I like to tell people that U.S. federal student loans are the most flexible but annoying debt you'll ever have. You do have the ability to pay them back based on percentages of your income, which can make them more manageable, but it looks very, very strange. Right? So some people can deal with that. Some people do not. My wife and I use income-driven repayment. Um, we're able to deal with that. Um, and we help a lot of our colleagues navigate the income-driven plans. We're seeing a lot of changes in those plans recently too, which is what makes them annoying. Uh, but you also have opportunities like public service loan forgiveness if you find yourself working for a nonprofit where some of those loans can be canceled after uh, doing some public service for uh, at least 10 years. So there are a lot of flexible options to help you manage your student loans, which is why you should focus on keeping any loans that you use for veterinary school in the U.S. federal student loan system. We do have some other resources available too. Once you get into veterinary school, actually next, on Monday, we're gonna meet with some UC Davis students. We're gonna talk about what we call borrow better, how to borrow less or keep your costs down while you're a student. And then once you get into repayment, we have a series of resources that fall into a category we call repay wiser. Just to make you aware, again, interest is, is really unfortunate when it comes to student loans. Um, and unfortunately, the interest rates for graduate school, veterinary school are going to be the highest that we've ever seen them at this particular structure. So over the last 20 or 25 years for the folks that are starting school this fall or anybody who's borrowing student loans for the next academic year. So for the 2024, 2025 academic year, uh, the veterinary school or graduate school professional student loans are at the highest rate that we've ever seen that. So um, this is going to add significantly to costs. So this is why it's so imperative. For a while, we've been able to kind of get away with, you know, not really talking about interest and the effect it has on the amounts that you're borrowing for school, uh, but those days are behind us, right? So we really have to be very, very careful about the tuition fees and living expenses that we're borrowing, um, which means we really want to focus on applying to and attending only those schools that have a lower price tag. If you do have the opportunity to receive some family support, it's generally better to receive that up front. You know, we always have these scenarios where, you know, grandma is super excited that you got into veterinary school because now finally somebody can take care of her 10 cats for her after you graduate. Uh, and she wants to give you a gift after you graduate um, for accomplishing that goal, right? But it would have been better if grandma gave you that gift in the beginning so you don't have to borrow more loans up front and accrue interest on those loans, right? The most expensive loans that you'll take is from that first year of veterinary school. So anything that you can do to reduce those costs in that first year are going to be, uh, you know, the most effective way to use those outside resources. Those are some of the things that we talk about in that borrow better uh, session. 
Private loans should be unnecessary. If your family offers you loans, I wouldn't take them. Right, so uh, you're never going to find more flexible loans than you'll receive for the U.S. federal student loan system. Again, they're really annoying, but they're going to be uh, much more flexible in repayment than any other loan that you can possibly uh, receive. California does a great job of illustrating kind of this dichotomy between, you know, we've got a state school and we've got a private school. Right. So if we take them as a as you know kind of a compare and contrast, right, we can look at these cost differences. Right. And for this particular case study, I'm going to assume that no health insurance is needed, right? But if you do need health insurance or your school requires you to have health insurance, you'll have to borrow that as well. Um, I'm going to assume a two and a half percent increase to tuition and fees per year. We're going to have the student borrow 80% of estimated living expenses. Um, I'm going to actually decrease student loan interest rates. I've told you that this year that they're the highest that they've ever been, but hopefully we're gonna see interest rates come down over the next few years. It'll probably be slowly, but let's hope that that happens. A school like UC Davis also provides a really valuable grant to tuition paying students in their veterinary programs. So those students usually receive somewhere around $7,000 per year in a grant from the state of California, which really helps to reduce the amount it costs them to get through that program. And thus it reduces their student loan balances. There is no grant that I'm aware of that's available for Western. Um, and I'm not gonna include loan fees here, but oftentimes there are fees associated with the loans that you'll receive. So, we can use, I, I kind of showed you guys this earlier, briefly, in the student debt center, we have what's called an in-school loan estimator, right? So in for the purposes of this, and just to keep this session moving along, we're going to do this for a student who's starting next month, right? And we're going to enter in a $7,000 grant, right? I'm going to assume that they're borrowing the rest of their cost of attendance. So this is 80% of the total cost of attendance. I'm assuming maybe these students are really frugal and they're able to reduce the total amount that the school estimates by about 20%. Now baked in here is tuition, fees, cost of living, right? So housing, right? All of that is in this amount that you borrow. Now the tuition and fees are gonna be taken right off the top, right? Goes directly to the school whatever the school doesn't take, you get back to use to cover your living expenses. Right? That's how generally the funding for school will work. Right? So if we assume you know, a 2%, 2.5% increase for tuition and fees per year, and we're taking 80% of the cost, our fourth year, at least at UC Davis, is going to cost us more than the first three years. And here I'm decreasing those interest rates each year, hoping that those interest rates are going to go down, right? If I hit the generate loan details button, this shows me that I'll borrow $224,000 roughly. I'll accrue about $36,000 of interest during that four years, and I'll graduate with a total balance of about $260,000. Right, now if I compare that same, that same scenario, for a Western student, right? So I've got a got a link here. And I can pull this up, right? It's a it's a lot higher because there is no in-state discount. There's no grant available, right? Same interest rates, right? I'm just borrowing higher amounts. I'm going to end up with $381,000 borrowed, $64,000 of in-school interest, so nearly double. Total cost about four hundred forty-five thousand. Right. So even if you if you live in California, and you know, you would choose to apply to both California schools, right? Those seats are not created equal. Right. Four hundred forty-five thousand dollar total versus here we're looking at two hundred sixty thousand. So nearly a two hundred thousand dollar cost difference. Right. So that's a that's a pretty big. That's a pretty big difference just based on which school you choose to apply to. All right, so higher principal means you're going to have higher interest. 
the grant assistance at UC Davis is really helpful to reduce the amount of student loans that you take. Uh, your odds of receiving an offer are higher at California as a California resident at UC Davis than they are uh, potentially at um, Western or another, not at applying to another uh, school as a non-resident, right? So it's it's a pretty big cost difference, right? I mean, a quarter of a million dollars nearly um, just based on which school you choose to apply to. Okay, so strategies to minimize your cost, right? Start with that in-state school option. If you don't have a school in your state, do you have one of those special arrangements like WICHE, Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education? So, you know, if you live in New Mexico, you can apply to a school like Colorado State and get a pretty significant uh, chunk off of that uh, tuition. I use the example of one of the recent Ben Foundation Mike Dunn Scholarship Award recipients. Uh, through the SREB or Southern Regional Education Board, um, a Kentucky resident who can attend Auburn and still pay that in-state tuition rate. So look for those types of arrangements for you. That will put you at the lower end of the student loan spectrum. If you need a backup set of options, here's a handful of states that allow you to pay in-state tuition after the first year even if you're not a resident of that state. So Missouri, NC State, Ohio State, UC Davis, Washington State. Texas A&M, if you maintain a B average, they'll pay the difference between your out-of-state uh, and in-state tuition. Uh, Texas Tech, if you live on the border with Texas in New Mexico, you're able to uh, pay the in-state rate. Here's some of these multi-location programs, so two plus two programs, uh, Nebraska with Iowa, Alaska with Colorado State, South Dakota with Minnesota, West Texas with Texas A&M, um, and then there's even a one plus three program with Montana and Washington State. So those will kind of put you somewhere in between the non-resident and resident borrowing range, right, but still at the lower end of the spectrum, right, that's what we're shooting for. And here's where we have the Apply Smarter tool, right, so I'm going to take you to the Apply Smarter tool um, on vinfoundation.org. And we created this to help guide people through the um, the scholarship, right? Because the scholarship has this, this cap, right? With, you know, you're not able to receive the scholarship if, if tuition and fees exceed $170,000 at the school that you're planning to attend, right? So we wanted to build a tool that helps give you an idea of which schools fall within that range based on where you live. Um, and on this Apply Smarter Tool website, we have a spreadsheet baked into it. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to open it. For whatever reason, this thing makes me open an incognito window to display it. But here you'll see, right, if I'm a resident of South Dakota, it's going to show me what schools are in my state. Right, so I've got that two plus two program South Dakota has, South Dakota State that ha has with University of Minnesota. I also have discounted opportunities with Iowa State, Minnesota, NC State, Ohio State, Davis, Washington State, Missouri. So lots of options there, right? Even though South Dakota doesn't have a veterinary school, there's a lot of options there to apply and still receive a discounted seat. And these are the four schools that would meet the scholarship threshold if you were to apply for the scholarship. So you could still be considered um, for that scholarship. And so four of those schools would be eligible for that $170,000 threshold. All right, so let's look at some of the schools that there's some of the states that you guys told me you were from. So Illinois, right? So Illinois has got a school of its own, right? but you can also apply to NC State. You'll pay out of state the first year, in state the next three years. Ohio State's the same way, Davis, Washington State, Missouri. Oh, somebody wanted to check out Virginia, right? We're going to do with Virginia. So yeah, this is the, this one caveat to this tool. Um, multiple people can be in here at the same time, but you'll see if somebody changes it, you'll see that change happen live like we just saw. So Virginia, another perfect illustration. We were talking about that earlier, Virginia, Maryland. 
right? Virginia, Maryland has multiple discounted options, right? And there are still four schools too that would meet the Mike Dunn scholarship threshold as well if you were to apply for that, right? So explore this, use this tool. It can really help. And it has like all of the, the uh, witchy schools, the Southern Regional Education Board schools in there. So for instance, I mentioned New Mexico, right? So if I show you New Mexico, Right, New Mexico has a whole bunch of witchy schools available to it. Uh, Hawaii is another big one that uh, has witchy school opportunities. Idaho is another one, right? So, you know, whatever school that, whatever state that you live in, select that, see which discounted seats that you have available to you, the Apply Smarter seats, and then some of those, if not all of them, will also meet that threshold for the Mike Dunn scholarship if you were to apply for that. <laughs> That's all right, Sarah, no worries. I, I, it was gave me a chance to talk about that. So, but yeah, feel free to jump in here and use that um, and change that whenever you would like um, to, you know, see see what your options are. I'll even put it back on, on, uh, on Virginia here. Cool. So it just shows me that you're following along, which is great. Okay, coming through home stretch here. So X factor, these are things I just generally encourage you to do, right? Demonstrate your interest to whatever school is on your top top list. Uh, do your homework. Make sure you know the requirements. Don't don't ask them questions that you can easily look up online, right? But if you want, you know, ask them about scholarship grant opportunities. If you don't see those admission stats, ask about admission stats. Ask them if they have any opportunities for a discounted tuition rate based on where you live or some other uh, opportunity that they may have. Uh, in general, um, first year students receive about $6,000 of scholarship, but again, it really depends on the school. So you have to ask them. Uh, if your target school requires you to interview, be prepared. Uh, we've had some blog posts that are written there on the Ben Foundation website uh, for um, panel interviews, as well as the multiple mini interviews that some schools will do. Uh, so we had some uh, veterinary students write those blog posts after going through those experiences. So you'll probably find that useful. Um, does your school, you know, have a certain test requirements? A lot of the schools have kind of done away with the test requirements. Um, this is a pretty interesting link that's available through the AAVMC website. It kind of does a quick breakdown of all of the different schools that are represented by that organization. These are pretty much the schools that you can apply to through VIMCAS as well. But you'll see here, it kind of gives you an idea of what all the class sizes are, um, you know, test requirements, right? There's a lot of none required. When I when I applied, you know, a long time ago now, double digit years ago, um, I, I didn't even know what Casper was, and GRE was pretty much required for all of them. And now the GRE is almost gone. It's not even on the list anymore, right? So and most of them have been kind of none required or the ones that do require a test do this, this newer Casper version. And so um, those are some uh, quick resources to help you at least figure out some of that basic information on the requirements for certain schools. Insights from other school applicants. Um, this is where, you know, this is one of the reasons why we created this Apply Smarter initiative, right? So generally speaking, for most pre-vets, the cost of applying uh, is, is a bigger deal than the actual price tag for the school, right? So on average, most pre-vets are applying to four to five schools. And that's cool. I mean, it's costing them $2,500 in total, right? Now, Vimcast will charge you some rate to actually submit your application to whatever number of schools that you choose to apply to, right? If you do four to five schools, you're looking at paying, you know, 620 to $750, right? But there's really no reason for you to go applying to, you know, six, seven, 10, 23, 45 schools, right? That's just, that's ludicrous, right? Not only is it really costly, but applying to more of those schools, while it may improve your odds of getting in, what it's really doing is increasing the chances that you're going to pay a lot more for your education than you have to, right? And then all of a sudden, this $2,500 turns into $250,000 extra that you have to pay for your education, 
right? So there's, you know, four, four to five is probably a pretty good number, right? That's a reasonable number of schools to apply to, right? But if you're going to apply to four or five schools, make sure it's your in-state school and then maybe one of those other schools that meets that apply smarter criteria, right? So you can maybe get a discounted rate after that first year, or maybe it's a two plus two program, or maybe it's a witchy school or an SREB school, right? Though that could be part of the four to five schools that you apply to. If you're not looking at the total cost before you apply, then it's going to be too late. Right? After you receive your offer of admission, you're not going to be able to do much about how much you pay for that education. Right. So this is what kind of stresses me out. Right. I wouldn't worry so much about the actual cost of applying, although you do have to have those funds so you can actually submit the applications. But this $2,500 is nothing compared to the $250,000 difference between, you know, UC Davis and Western that we illustrated, right? So, you know, make sure you're focused on, on the, the things that are going to have the biggest impact, right? So yes, applying to more than five schools is probably going to increase your odds of paying more than you actually have to for your education. So instead, consider Apply Smarter, the best time to consider your costs are before you actually submit your applications. Right? Because if you submit your application to one of those schools that's going to cost you three, four, five hundred thousand dollars and you get an offer, you're probably going to take that offer. Right. And once you accept that seat, you're you're kind of you're you're stuck paying whatever that price tag is. So don't tempt yourself to pay more than you have to. Uh, there, there's not much you can do about those costs after you already accept that seat. If you have questions about any of this stuff, we have an apply smarter message board too. We do need you to create a username and password so we know that you're interested in veterinary school. Right? We The message board area is where we actually uh, have veterinarians and veterinary students so you can get some insight from those people as well as myself and, and, and our colleagues on this concept or any other questions you have on applying. Um, so I would encourage you to join, right? So you can create a username and password. You'll be able to access the VIN Foundation Apply Smarter message board. Uh, you can even post anonymously in there if you'd like, but you can ask questions about anything that we uh, covered here and then you'll get the answers that you need and your colleagues can also learn from those discussions as well. But you can create, you can create a username and password pretty easy. Uh, using those links that are in there. It's always easy to manage less student debt than it is to manage more. Uh, more. And if you're going to borrow or you have to use student loans, which most of you will, uh, your U.S. federal student loans are going to be the most flexible but annoying debt that you're ever going to have. Your best odds of acceptance are usually aligned with your least expensive options, right? So that's a win-win. Right. So make sure you're at least including your in-state or the least costly option available to you in your list of uh, schools that you're applying to. Look for those other options that allow you to switch residency after that first year or other unique opportunities that might allow you to pay less uh, than that full price. Here are the um, a list of resources that go into kind of creating this presentation and ones that you might benefit from. Here again is that uh, a link to um, create that username and password so you can post questions in the Apply Smarter message board area. And then we'll make sure that um, you guys get access to this presentation. It, it, it'll live online and all the links that are in here, you can click from the presentation themselves, but we'll we'll provide a lot of those resources as well. Uh, as part of the materials that we'll send out in the next day or two uh, from this from this presentation. Any other questions that you all have or anything that I missed um, that you were hoping that I was going to cover? Yeah, Anthony, so the, the recording will be posted. Uh, it'll be posted on um, the VIN Foundation website. So under programs here, uh, under student debt, there's an Apply Smarter page. And we generally put the most recent of the recordings in the Apply Smarter resources, but um, we'll also send you a link to uh, the recording. But it, it'll live on YouTube as well. So, but we'll embed that YouTube uh, replay video into uh, this Apply Smarter page as well. 
And Any then Kiara other... had another question about do loans oh, okay. help you with yeah. house? Do most loans help you with housing, not necessarily on campus housing? Yeah. So uh, most of most veterinary students don't use campus housing, right? You you pretty much live quote off campus, even though you might be really close. Uh, but your cost of attendance is going to include a housing allowance. Right, so um, here I'll, I'll I can demonstrate that too. Actually, uh, let me do that. Let's see if this will work. So, CSU, veterinary school, cost of attendance. Every veterinary school is going to have um, something like this, right? So for CSU, if you're a you know resident, so sponsored in this case means uh, resident. They'll show you the tuition and fees. Here's the off-campus housing, right? So they give you an allowance specifically to cover those housing expenses, right? Now, that doesn't mean that's how much it will cost you, right? This just is how much they're going to offer you in student loans to cover your housing. And it's going to be up to you to find a housing arrangement that will fit within that budget. Right. Same with the food, transportation, books and supplies, right? These are not um, costs that are going to necessarily be reflective of what's shown here. This is just an estimate. The tuition and fees, that's that's what Colorado State is going to take from you, from your loans, right? The rest of these are estimates. They'll give you loans based on these estimates, and then you have to use that amount to cover your general living expenses like housing, food, transportation, anything else. This there's a question of is that annually or over or total number? This is yeah, this is an annual number. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is the resident, right? So if we go to the non-resident, right, this is why this is so important. Right. <laughs> it's a great question, right? I mean, it, it, so you know, just generally speaking, multiply that by four. Right. And that's the tuition and fees that you're going to pay. Then we have to consider all of the living expenses, right? Tuition and fees for a non resident are more than $20,000 a year higher. So $80,000 total for the four years, just for the privilege of not living in Colorado. Right. In this case. Yeah. So this is, this is the annual number. And there's four years for most veterinary school programs. The only exception currently is um, is Arizona. They've got school at University of Arizona is a three-year program. Same number of semesters, you just don't get any summer off. So uh, generally the costs are about the same. You just finish a little bit sooner. Good question though. Any other questions? That's all that we have. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for all the uh, engagement there. And hopefully you guys found this useful. We'll be posting a link to the recording and providing some materials to you all uh, in the coming days here. And you can click through that at your leisure. And again, I would encourage everybody to join that, um, you know, create a username and password and, and, and participate in that Apply Smarter message board and ask questions. Um, questions either like the ones you were asking here tonight or any other questions that come up for you as you're applying uh, to veterinary school and beyond. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for joining and we look forward to seeing you hopefully on the pre-veterinary message boards. Great. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.